They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9.04 Wednesday, July 6th. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And guys, I can't believe it, but we're only eight days away from the start of the Saratoga meet. We need like a 12 Days of Christmas song for Saratoga, like eight terrible tips that you got from some guy who knew the clocker's brother. That's the only one I've thought of so far. Good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. If I appear to be a little off my game today, it's because I'm not focused. I'm just so worried about my exactas and trifectas this <laughs> afternoon. Degenerate. <laughs> Jonathan Green, uh, general manager of DJ Stable. And I got a feeling today's podcast is going to be full of cross checks, elbowing, and uh, and maybe a little bit of slashing. I'm just hoping that we don't get put maybe in a penalty Five for fighting, today. John. Keep interrupting me. Five for fighting. Could be five for fighting. Actually, I don't know if you guys realize, but – you are, obviously, you know, our guest is Eric Johnson this week. You know that. But I don't think you guys realize that I actually held the Stanley Cup before Eric Johnson did. Back in 1995, uh, when the Devils won their inaugural Stanley Cup, um, I actually, John Dad was training for us, and, his, and his, uh, I think his cousin Jim was playing for the Devils. And Jim brought the Stanley Cup to Monmouth Park, and I actually got to hold the son of a gun. And, and it was electric. It was, like, unbelievable how, uh, how you know, how that felt. Um, and, and, you know, it was just an amazing, amazing feeling. I mean, the trophy is huge and you can see when these guys are like hoisting it up, what goes, you know, how, how heavy it is. Um, it, it's really an amazing thing. And Jim was telling us some of the stories of what they did with the Stanley cup. You don't want to drink out of that son of a gun. The TDN writer's room is brought to you by Keeneland. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale beginning Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at the world's yearling sale.com. All right, so all you people who say we complain too much and we bitch about the ills of racing all day long, you're going to love this. We're going to start this show for a while, I think, talking about some of the great racing performances from the past weekend. We had a lot of big efforts from horses that are either at the top of their division or we expect to be big factors in their division the rest of the year. It was a tremendous July 4th holiday weekend of racing. And, you know, there's a lot to talk about. We might split this up into two segments because there were so many great races and great efforts. But I'll start with the, the older horses that are going to be on a clash course now for the Whitney at Saratoga. Life is good and Olympia. They both were terrific over the weekend. Life is good was a little more visually dazzling because he really put away speaker's corner and the John Nehrud kicked away to an easy, easy five length win. First race off the off the plane from Dubai after that fourth fourth place finish in the Dubai World Cup. Got a 112 buyer. You know, it's tied for the second highest of anybody this year in racing. And, you know, not to be outdone, Olympiad, I thought, that was a real breakout performance for him and the Stephen Foster. Now, I've been a big Olympiad fan this whole time, and I've thought that I've always thought that he's better than his figures might indicate. He was getting like 103 buyers for his races because I felt like he was in these kind of slow paced races. And you can only finish so fast on dirt and stop the clock in, in a certain amount of time. This time he was up on a qu- pretty quick pace in the Foster, had to do a lot of dirty work. It looked like American Revolution was going to get the, the jump on him, the perfect trip, you know, that like inside outside trip, but Olympiad. Turned him back, won by two and a quarter lengths, and he got an easily career best 111 buyer. You know, those two, I think, are going to be so interesting in in the Whitney. You know, life is good. Maybe he'll get out and just get loose and, and, you know, dust Olympiad and the rest of those horses. Or maybe Olympiad will prove to be better at nine furlongs going two turns at Saratoga. There's a lot more to get to, but those two excited me in particular. What would you guys think? Yeah, uh, Joe, they were exciting performances uh, and, and a couple uh, kind of other notes. Um, Olympiad has still never won a grade one race, has not even contested a grade one. Though that in the Stephen Foster, that was a grade one field. I mean, I've been complaining about how races should be downgraded. This is a race that should be upgraded. I mean, you had Mandaloon in there. You had the Kentucky, you know, the, in the Kentucky Derby winner. You had American Revolution, the Cigar winner. You know, Proxy's a good horse. Um, so is uh, Cato River and all that. But first of all, back to life is good. And, you know, remember prior to the Dubai World Cup, you know, we were saying, or we in general, the, not just of the three of us, but people in racing in general, were saying some of the things that we've come to say about Flightline. Now, about this is a absolute superstar. You know, how good is this horse? You know, Todd Pletcher, who is never one to really get involved in hyperbole, uh, said he wouldn't say it's the best horse he ever trained. But he says, I don't know if I've ever had one better. 
That was after the Pegasus World Cup when he just demolished Nick's go, the horse of the year, and, and, and in and of himself, one really, really good horse. So, you know, he runs in Dubai. He doesn't run well. Pletcher said it was the track that it was just so deep and everything. He didn't really take to it. But, it, you know, he was kind of, I wouldn't say forgotten, but he kind of took a back seat as flight line mania took hold with all that he's been doing. And, you know, he reminded us on Saturday why we thought this was, horse was so good and was so special. And now a couple things. First of all, gee, a four horse field in a stakes race. How about that in the John A. Nehru? But nonetheless, it, it, it didn't matter that it was four horses in so much as there was a worthy challenger in there in speaker's corner. So there was a horse in there that, you know, if he's going to beat this horse, it's going to mean something. How about poor Speaker's Corner? And you got to give Bill Mott some credit. He's thrown, him to, thrown a horse to the wolves. Got done with running against Flight Line. Now let's run against Life is Good. So, you know, of the two, I would say right now, I would prefer Life is Good. He'll be the favorite over Olympiad in the Whitney. Uh, it should be a great race. Wouldn't it? Could you imagine what it would be like if they actually going to run Flight Line in there as well? But at one point, we thought he might run in the Whitney. But, you know, two A plus performances from two A plus horses. But, you know, now I can't wait to see what Life is Good does in the Whitney and wherever they go after that. It's really setting up, uh, you know, an interesting couple of races um, in November at the Breeders' Cup. You know, you have this pool of wonderful horses, whether it's Olympiad, Life is Good, Flight Line, which you've all mentioned. You know, Mo Donegal, who won the Belmont, um, Jack Christopher, who just continues to have eye popping after eye popping, um, you know, one turn races, but still, you know, it, it's just at the top of his game right now. And guys, we didn't even talk about Charge It, who won by 23 lengths in the Dwyer. I mean, that, that was just an incredible um, effort by him just in cruise control almost for the entire, you know, second half of the race. And granted, it wasn't a stellar field in there, but to win any race by 23 lengths. Um, and to run a 111 buyer, which is comparable to what Olympiad ran and just one, uh, you know, tick away from what life is good as ran. So, you know, almost almost all three of them ran convincing wins and, and eye popping uh, numbers. You know, it is starting to take shape where this summer and this fall is going to be must see TV when it comes to all of these grade ones and grade twos coming up. Um, I hope the stars align and that they start, you know, going head to head sooner rather than later. But Man, depending on what decisions some of these um, owners and trainers make on on their horses, if they're going to go, you know, to the to the mile, or they're going to go to the classic at the at the end of the year in the Breeders' Cup. It, it is going to be, you know, just an excellent excellent race card, uh, you know, come the first weekend of November. Yeah, no, I mean that was my takeaway too, more than just any of these the individual performances. And yeah, Charge It, Charge It was incredible to watch, you know, just to widen consistently through the stretch like that. I don't remember the last graded stake I saw one by twenty three lengths. He got a 111 buyer, which is the fastest, clearly, by a three-year-old so far this year. And, you know, just just to put into context where we're at with these top-class horses, especially going one turn, Speaker's Corner has the highest buyer speed figure in America this year. He got a 114 when he won the Carter. And then all he did was get his doors blown off when he met Flightline and Life is Good. Now, any other year, I feel like Speaker's Corner would be the top sprinter miler in the country. And now this time, th this year, he can't even make a dent with two other horses in back-to-back -back races. And like you said, good on Bill Mott for not being scared to run him and actually take a shot at Life is Good. It didn't work, obviously, but he's going he's gonna to have some more big races and some, some more big wins in his future, I'm sure, as well. And, yeah, like my takeaway more than any individual performance is just how we have like a remarkable amount of exciting horses that we've seen produce, you know, dazzling performances so far this year. You guys mentioned them flight line, Jack Christopher, life is good. Olympiad now charge it. Like if this is any harbinger of what's to come for the rest of this summer and fall, we're in for a really, really special year of racing. And just the amount of raw talent out there right now is, is a blessing, I think. And to be appreciated as a racing fan, especially guys like us, who complain all day on the show. That's what we get paid to do. But, you know, once in a while, we got to we got to appreciate all of the, the talent and the, the terrific performances we've seen out there. And we just you got to hope all these horses stay healthy. You got to hope they actually meet, you know, before the Breeders' Cup. But, you know, there's there's a lot of horses coming up this summer and fall that what I would say are appointment viewing. You do not want to miss these horses running like I just named five of them. You could probably name a couple more. You want to name a couple of the top three year olds. But, yeah, that's. That that is to be excited about and to be looked forward to this summer and fall and and I did, you know I think Bill's uh, selling Olympiad a little short you know I think 
Life is good. It depends on how much other speed is in the race, but that's a race that we're going to look forward to. We're a month away right now exactly from the Whitney, and that's one that I think we're going to have on our calendar for a while. So I'm still Team Olympiad. Someone send me an Olympiad hat or shirt, would you? Like J.D. Roth, somebody. I've, all I've done is extol the virtues of Olympiad for months on this show, and I still have no swag. Um, but, yeah, so that that was incredible to watch in, in the Nehrud and the just the Dwyer. And it, it was great. It was just one after another. And not to be not to be left out. How about the two year olds and John or John Green and Len Green and DJ Stable had a big time winner with Wonder Wheel and the debutante on Monday at Churchill Downs. So congratulations to the DJ Stable team and John. I, you know, she was a horse that I think you guys had a lot of high hopes for and she's she's lived up to them so far. And then how about Gulfport in, in the bashful manner, as John would say. Talk about a monster. I mean, just a horse that popped out to the front and just galloped the entire way around. He looked great in his debut, more than validated that in the bash. bash now, now I can't say Bashford Manor. Now Bashful Manor is stuck in my, stuck in my head. Um, but he actually, he stopped the clock in 109 and 1. It was the second fastest time in the history of the Bashford Manor. They've been running the race for 120 some odd years. And the only other horse that was faster than him, another Steve Asmussen trainee, Kodiak Cowboy was the only horse that ran faster than Gulfport. But yeah, any, any, any comments from you guys on the two-year-olds? Well, can I get back to charge it uh, first? Because I didn't know we were going to, uh, John sort of jumped the line in a little bit here. Um, I remember after this horse ran second in the Florida Derby, I was like, uh, wow. Was he second or was he third? I think he, he was second, second in the Florida Derby. Okay. That this horse was so green, so inexperienced that when he put it all together, watch out. Now he ran up the track in the Derby. He had a, a displaced a pallet, one of those breathing problems that Fletcher had to get fixed. And now it looks like he is going to fulfill his potential. And, you know, honestly, the, the, the horses that, I mean, he did run in the Derby, but you don't think of him so much as one of those horses that, from the Triple Crown because he ran lousy in the Derby, didn't run in the Preakness or Belmont. But, you know, the the real stars of this division now look to be the two horses, Jack Christopher and him, that were either didn't run in the Triple Crown races or in the Charges case was an afterthought. I would say that he didn't really beat a very good field. But nonetheless, you don't win a race by 20 three lengths unless you're doing something really really special so you know again it, you know unfortunately it's racing so three, half these horses will get hurt and uriah st louis will round out the, the the you know the breeders cup classic with the field of seven type of thing but you're right joe i mean you take this there's about half dozen horses out there and now charge it belongs on this list that you know you just like our wow factor horses and he definitely belongs in that occasion um equation also um you know the timing of this was it was a good news bad news week for Pletcher. remember mo donegal is hurt now and he's out for the rest of the year so without mo donegal it looked like Pletcher didn't really have a, a 3-0 for the travers etc now this horse jumps up and it's like holy moly you know he's got uh i imagine that he said maybe jim dandy maybe not but if he were to go right from here to the travers well, I'll ask you, I'll throw this out there. Would he be favored over Zandon and early vote? I think he would, wouldn't he? I would have to think so. But but I, I jumped on the Charger bandwagon way earlier. Um, if you remember, I picked him first overall in, in our in our contest because of the way he won, you know, so impressively early on in his career. Um, and now he is finally fulfilling his um, his potential. But, you know, anytime you get a horse that's royally bred like Charger, uh, tap it out of an Indian Charlie mare, and you think those horses can just run all day long. Um, he is still green, even after winning by 23 lengths. If you watch the race, his ears are still kind of pricked as, as he's running and he kind of cocks his head a little bit to see, you know, what's going on. So, um, you know, he, he is still kind of fulfilling his, his destiny and, and getting better and, and, and getting more focused. It's going to be exciting to see just how Pletcher navigates this horse's career through the end of the year. Um, and the only other horse that, Recently that I can say that, that I was equally as impressed as when Charger won, uh, you know, broke his maiden is, is Gulfport um, in the stake race at Churchill. I mean, it, again, it was a glorified day of the then, which all of these baby races are at this stage of the game. Um, but that being said, you know, Gulfport broke from the one hole like he was shot out of a cannon and never looked back. Um, and, and I know that's the way that, that Steve Asmussen's babies run. And he's famous for having them ready to go first time out, second time out, and then as the distances get longer and, and the competition gets a little stiffer, um, sometimes the horses can't come up to that level. But, man, as far as this point in time, um, at, at, this, uh, at this stage of Gulfport's career, he is just an awesome, awesome horse. And, again, 
very well bred. Uncle Mo out of an unbridled song there. You would think he could go all day. He's not He's not a big, robust Uncle Mo unbridled song. Like when you say those two stallions, you think this horse is going to be a big 17 hand, um, you know, kind of thick horse. And he's not. He's, he's more he, he more looks like a first fall, even though he, he's not a first fall. But he almost looks like a little bit more refined and a little bit on the smaller side um, than most of the Uncle Mo's and unbridled song lineage the lineage horses are. Um, but man, he was explosive, just explosive in that race. And, and don't forget guys, it was like a hundred degree heat index. Um, and, and for him to put in that kind of a run on that kind of a day, um, was just extraordinary. And Joe, I appreciate you, you mentioning wonder wheel. You know, we're very excited about her. She's now undefeated in two races and, uh, we'll see how she does as she continues to develop, um, plans are to run her in the spin away, um, at the, at the end of Saratoga, give her a little time and, and, bring her over to Saratoga. Um, and I was really glad to see that super fan Skip Anderson actually came out and he was chronicling his, his travels, you know, from North Dakota, although he drove from North Carolina to, to Louisville um, and then spent the afternoon there watching the races and got to go in the winter circle with, with wonder wheel and then, you know, drove to see some relatives in Wisconsin. So um, tip of the cap to, to our man, Skip Anderson, um, who, cause he also put in a yeoman's uh, you know, type of travel, um, you know, getting to Churchill Downs and uh, getting his picture taken. Well, and like you said last week, thank God Wonder Wheel won because then he would never be allowed back. Because Dan, our good side, ran right fourth. Um, and I, listen, nobody was going to beat Gulfport on that day. To me, Dan, our good side looks more like a turf synthetic horse. That's just my my layman's opinion. Watching him and watching his stride, and, and he's kind of a high strider. Um, so that that would be my opinion on what his future is. But yeah, so Skip was at least a good luck, luck charm um, for Wonder Wheel. And yeah, that, that was like a great capper, I think, for the weekend was, was those two year old races. We got a uh, Gulfport got a 91 buyer. Wonder Wheel got a 76. You would expect both of them to be major contenders this summer and fall. So, yeah, lot, lots to be excited about and, and you know, lo- lots to portend for the future for Saratoga and this fall. You know, <laughs> Chad's face. It was a five dollar word for you, John. I, you, you were throwing out. You must have read your thesaurus. He was hard to or. Yeah, you, I mean, you threw out a couple of great vocab words. I, I was very, very – you might want to take, retake the SATs. <laughs> All right, let's, let's quit while we're ahead, except I had one more point. Um, how about uh, the influence of Take Charge Lady? We're talking about Charge It, because Take Charge Lady obviously was, has, was a great race mare, but it's also been a great brood mare. It's, as time goes by, Take Charge Indy will take charge. But now she's the second dam. Now she's old enough that she has the influence in this, as the second dam in a horse like Charge It, her daughter, I'll Take Charge produce charlotte she's by, by charge by indian charlie like john said earlier so yeah she's she's been a great influence and it's definitely a blue hen brood mare and and yeah i remember bill talking about how great charge it was in the florida derby and at the time i was like eh, like he looked pretty good but bill was obsessed with charge's performance in that race it turned out he was right that horse has a ton of talent and has really vaulted now just off that one performance into the upper echelon of the three-year-old races. And it depends on what happens in the Jim Dandy and the Haskell. You know, I, we got to see what happens first. But, yeah, Charge It, even if he trains up to the Travers from here, got to be one of the first two or three choices, I would think. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Great stakes winning Keeneland sales grads from this past week. It include Grade 2 Highlander winner, Bound for Nowhere. Grade 2 Stephen Foster winner, Olympiad. Grade 2 Florida Lee winner, She Dares the Devil. And Grade 2 John Nehrud winner, Life is Good. So obviously a great performance from the Keeneland sales grads over the weekend. And in the most recent edition of our terrific Keeneland Breeders Spotlight Series, Chris McGrath talks to Tommy Wente, who bred three winners and one runners, one runner-up of Breeders Cup winning your in races last year. Tommy bought the dams of those four horses for an impressive total of just thirty-two thousand four hundred dollars. We always love those bargain bit, those bargain bin buys at auctions that turn into you know big windfalls for these trainers and owners and breeders. Tommy's program focuses on purchasing mares with limited pedigrees and then giving them time for their families to accomplish something big, which they're obviously doing now. One of his most recent successes is the dam of grade three Ohio Derby winner, Tawny Port, who he purchased for $30,000 at the 2020 Keeneland November sale. You can find the story at the TDN. It's called Tawny Port, another strike for Wenty. Love that feature. Love that series from Chris. Obviously a great writer and he does great at, he does a great job at unearthing these stories because there's a ton of them in the racing business and that's why we love it and that's why we keep coming back. So we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Keeneland September Yearling Sale. A terrific maternal pedigree, grade one winners, and champions across the bay. Echo Zoo parties! Life is good! Let's go! Superstar! Go to the back. Good luck. It was just put together like a machine, and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law, pops the cork in the champagne. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law. Tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Another big weekend for Ashford Sire, Super Sire, Uncle Mo on Saturday. He had his 80th stakes winner, 80 stakes winners, when Super Hoity Toity, great name, took the grade three Celine at Woodbine. And then on Monday, Gulfport, who we obviously just mentioned and is going to be at the top of everybody's minds in terms of the two-year-olds, won by over 12 lengths, 12 and a quarter, and was became the seventh stakes winner of the year for Uncle Mo. And practical joke. Who and somehow I feel like Practical Joe was a st- little bit under the radar still in that crop, but he's he has been a terrific early sire. He had another juvenile winner on Friday with Fancy Joke, who romped to a six and a quarter length victory at Monmouth in her debut. Third impressive debut winner for Practical Joke in less than a week after song parody and Akrita both won at Belmont over over the last week or week and a half. Akrita I thought looked really really good. He was a three year old, a little bit of a later starter for Chad Brown. Looks like a total monster for Clarevich. He got bet down in that race, went like four or five wide, still ran away in the stretch, got a 91 buyer, I believe. That was a really impressive performance. So practical joke runners are all over the place. Definitely get down there to Ashford and get get involved with him. All right, so in this week's edition of Hate Mail Letters to Bill Finley, we had a special letter to the editor last week in the TDN. It unfortunately got published, like, I think a little bit after our show. Otherwise, we could have talked about it last week. And it was Terrence Collier, who was a longtime facing Tipton, uh, you know, announcer. And, and he's been an industry insider for a while now going after Bill for his article that we all agreed with last week, that there were too many stakes races and too many graded stakes races. Bill, I'll let you take it away. Well, I'm more interested to see what you guys have to say, because, you know, I, I don't want to get in a pissy match with the guy. Um, and, you know, I, I honestly, you know, I look at things like this and I just, you know, I, I either laugh or cry and maybe a little bit of both here. Um, but, you know, I, I guess what my first opinion would be is that, you know, he doesn't speak for anybody but himself. I understand that. He doesn't work for Fasic Tipton anymore. He's not part of the racing industry anymore. But the attitude was something that we've been railing about, everybody's been railing about. It was just of somebody whose mindset is not about what's good for the sport, what's good for the game, what's good for the betters. He is only caring about what was his own fiefdom, and that would be the sales ring. If horses had a lot of black type, they're gonna they're gonna sell for more. Um and you know it was it was just tone death. And and it it's sad because you know you like to think that you know, that kind of mentality has gone away. The old boy network has slowly been eroded and, and chipped away at. And again, like I said, he doesn't speak for anybody but himself. But, you know, this whole and I made the joke in the beginning about the exactus and trifectus. He said, well, obviously, all Bill cares about is exactus and trifectus. Well, number one, I don't, that's not all I care about. Obviously not. But even if I did, why is that a problem? And, you know, what he should have written instead of all Bill cares about is exactus and trifectus is Horse players don't matter. Isn't that really the exact same thing as saying? And you know, you read, you read something like this, and I don't think I'm 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 going off off the rails here, or or putting words in his mouth that 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 he didn't really say himself. But it's like, who cares about short fields? Because I wrote something about we're all sick of three twenty winners and 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 uh, you know six twenty exactus. Uh, all Bill cares about is exactus and trifectas. Well. You know what? The horse racing industry better care a little bit more about exactus and trifectas because it's still the horse players that are the backbone of this game. And they're the ones that put money in John Green's pocket when he runs in these big purses, et cetera. And, you know, it, it, it really is. I mean, again, I'm sort of flabbergasted here um, because it was just so wrong. I mean, my goodness. 
Yeah, and, and and nothing would make me happier than to be able to agree with somebody who's anti bill. Really, honestly, I mean that would that would that would make me go for the day. Um, but and I know Terrence, and, and I've known Terrence for a number of years. And and you know when he was the auctioneer and the announcer at the sales of Fasic Tipton, it was his voice that was literally that was carrying you through the the entire auction. And and he was able to to craft his you know his his wares to be able to get people to bid one more time and take that extra bid and 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 he you know he was really he, he was the pinnacle of of that uh, of that industry and and I have a lot of respect for him about that um, but I don't remember ever seeing Terrence own a horse I don't remember ever seeing Terrence breed a horse um, where he would have skin in the game to have this much negativity towards uh, what Bill wrote. And, and you know, he brought up a couple, Terrence brought up a couple of arguments that, that I just don't agree with. Um, uh, you know, number one, he said, you know, that, that Bill was basically, um, you know, taking the easy way out and saying, well, of course it's easy to, 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 to shit can some of these, you know, stake races and, and that would be the answer for everything. Well, if you look at it from a statistical standpoint, with the fall crop decreasing every year, um, and the number of stake raises increasing every year. Um, it's no wonder that that you know we get these four horse fields in these in these stake races, and we've talked about that you know for a long time. So we don't need to do it. But it used to be guys where black type had meaning, black type had value, and when you saw a family that had a number of black type performers, it really meant something. And and we've turned into as an industry that if some is good, more is better. And we just keep adding stake races and adding stake races. And, and it's just not, I mean, it, it's great when you're a breeder because you can point to it and say, well, now I have black type. And for most of the people in the industry, they don't um, differentiate, you know, finishing third in a stake race at, at, uh, at Zia Park versus, you know, finishing third in a stake race at, at, at Belmont, um, you know, for example. They just see, oh, there's black type in the family. So therefore, they must be at a higher level. But we've, we've lost that panache and, and value of black type races because they're so watered down right now. Um, but I think we really, as an industry, need to look at it as let's make black type worth something again. Um, so that way, if you do have a chance to breed a horse that wins or places in the stake race, it's got much more value to it rather than every every other horse that's in a sale now is a half to or a, a daughter of, um, you know, a, a black type winner. And I'm a breeder and, and I'm saying that, you know, so, so it, it, it does show you just, you know, the, the, the lack of value or the, or the watered down value. Um, you know, in, in that in that industry. The other thing is, you know, Bill did not go after popular, you know, the, the, or, 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 uh, unlike popular belief, Bill did not go after the American Graded Stakes Committee. He did not say they do a crappy job. He did not even indicate, um, you know, that, that they weren't worth their value. I think we all agree that they have a very difficult job to do. What we're saying is that, you know, maybe the criteria needs to be changed um, with regard to some of these stake races, because it just doesn't have the same kind of value, again, that, that we talked about before. So, you know, the main arguments that, that, that Terrence brought up against Bill, I would not say hold water. Um, I could think of a couple other ones that I could attack Bill on, you know, that, that, that Terrence didn't. But that'd be, that'd be for another segment. That'll be for my op-ed piece, you know, down the road. <laughs> can't wait for, yeah, can't wait for John's op-ed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like, like you said, like, like Bill was saying, it's just this kind of dismissive attitude towards horse players that I think really sticks in people's craw. And I think rightfully so, because, you know, we always talk about it and a lot of people talk about it, about how the two main drivers of growth and of economic prosperity in the industry are owners and horse players. And I think that, unfortunately, they're, you know, their their interests should be aligned, but a lot of times they're not aligned because for the owners, it's better to find a five horse field that, you know, in the past would have been 10, 11, 12 horses. You got a better chance of hitting the board at least and getting some black, black type. Whereas I'm not interested as a better betting on that five horse field. But, you know, if you have, if you have enough horses and you have enough, you have enough quality horses and just a little bit less racing, I think there will still be plenty of opportunities. Like I think we just have this, this glut of stakes races and graded stakes races. And it's like, like you guys are saying, it's good, for everybody except the horse player. It's good for the trainers. It's good for the breeders. It's good for the owners, unless their horses are shelved for no reason. And I just think I, this is the, this is the quote that really, that, that annoyed me, I think, because I've heard it from a bunch of people um, it says quote, his solution all too glibly proffered by one with a little skin in the breeding and owning game is to throw out iconic races like the mother goose, the Hollywood gold cup, and to take the knife to the Naira steak schedule. Simple answer, problem solved. 
I just hate that attitude. I hate that if I don't own a horse, if I'm not a millionaire, if I don't own a horse, never mind that I've been betting the horses for 20 years now almost in my life. I've put hundreds of thousands of dollars through the window in terms of handle that my opinion doesn't matter. And that, you know, if I have a complaint or if I have an issue with all the five and six horse fields all across America and how depressing it is as a horse player and even a little bit as a fan, that that shouldn't matter because the people with more money and more power and more clout than me the system is good for them. So that's, I think, was was the the problem that I had with it. You know, Terrence is obviously a smart guy. He's obviously had a, had a bunch of experience in the game, but he has, like John, like Bill said, that kind of old boys club attitude where the horse players are the little dirty people that are just a necessary evil so all of you can keep making your millions of dollars and keep, you know, pumping it through the, the breeding and, and the owning game. And yeah, I just, I, I don't agree with that. And I think that, you know, there's, I think it's kind of indicative of why racing is in the not great shape that it is, because I think there are too many myopic people who are just just looking at what's good for them and their friends and their crew and their, you know, their upper echelon of the game. And they're not worried about the actual drivers of the game who are us, us little people, us horse players at the bottom. And, you know, I, I just think it's, yeah, like we have, like we saw yesterday, the economic indicators came out, for uh, June and and the first half and the second quarter of 2022. And I'm looking at it right now, 6.93 was the average field size in June of 2022. That's even down from last year, 6.99. For the second quarter, 7.02, down from 7.16. For the year, it's 7.25, down from 7.43. We're going to get to a point where the average field size is approaching six horses. And in a lot of those races, you can't even have a super. There are some tracks in some jurisdictions where you can't have a super effect on a six horse field. Is that where you want to be, Terrence? Do you think that's a good future for the game? There are clearly, clearly too many races in America, too many graded stakes races. And the the way it it gets noticed most is on these graded stakes cards because those are the ones that everybody tunes into. Those are the ones that everybody circles on their calendar. They want to see these horses. They want to see these big name races. And you open the PPs and you see a bunch of five and six horse fields. And it cannot be anything but a bummer if, you know, (laughs) unless you don't have skin in the game, as Terrence would say, unless you're not a horse player, unless you don't bet, unless, you know, that's the only reason you can be okay with these paltry fields and these great stakes fields, if you don't have skin in the game from a horse player's perspective, and maybe you should. Yeah, and, and Joe, just to jump on what you were saying about the, the small fields and, and how they're so, you know, betters just don't look at it. it. Let me give you an example of four greatest stake races over the weekend. Um, you know, the, she dares the devil won at a dollar forty. Her exacta paid fourteen dollars. CC won the the Princess Rooney. Um, she paid two dollars and eighty cents to win. The exact that was seven dollars. Charge it, you know, one at even money. Um, paid uh, three dollars to win. The exact in that race was uh, ten dollars. And then life is good in the four horse field neighborhood, um, who won and paid a whopping two dollars and forty cents to win. And the exact that paid a dollar sixty. So, like, it, you know, it, who's betting on those races? Um, right. As opposed to, you know, you look at the handle in Woodbine um, for, for their big weekend that they had, and they, they actually brought in, they didn't even race on Monday, on, on, on July 4th day, and they brought in $17.5 million in, in wagering because a lot of their fields were, were six, seven, ten horse fields. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, if you want to look at anything just from, from a gambler standpoint or from a, a life expectancy standpoint of this industry, you want to look at what racetracks are thriving and which ones aren't and which stake races are thriving and which ones aren't. Look mm-hmm. at the pools. Look at who's betting and how much they're betting and tell me what's better. Look at Kentucky yeah. Downs. Look at Kentucky Downs. That, right. was a, that was an irrelevant racetrack. Even as little as you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was mostly irrelevant. They had one or two stakes races. They have put a ton into that program. They've increased purses and they've increased field size. And now it's one of the best betting opportunities of the year. And Handle goes up every single year. They run six days a year and Handle skyrockets every single year because they actually care about putting on a bettable product for the horse players. Sorry, Bill. Yeah, a couple more points. First of all, Joe, thanks so much for bringing up that point about that. And it's not just Terrence Collard. We've heard that all along. The You don't have skin in the game. What a bunch of garbage that is. If you if you bet this game, you got a ton of skin in the game. And you're right. It's like these unwashed masses to 
you know, again, at least to Terrence Collier, and I understand he's only speaking for himself, but apparently don't matter to this individual. And I think that there's other people out there. But let's, let's John was talking about all the races last week. First of all, um, I didn't even know there wasn't Quinella anymore in New York, but the Quinella on the John A. Nay route paid 220, 220 for the Quinella. But here we go again on Saturday, you have a race with a great history, the Suburban. It's being run on Saturday. It's a $400,000 purse. It's got five horses. The ubiquitous has to be, of course, a Uriah St. Louis in there. There is. He makes five. And it's really, look, I don't want to beat up on Naira because I, I think they've been running some great races. But, you know, here's another example of a, of a race that it's it's really not a good race by no stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, good old Max Player is in there. I remember when I was being accused of being a Max, the biggest Max Player um, <laughs> fan out there. Um, but look, I, I mean, it sounds blasphemous, but do you really need this race? You know, at some point in time, you know, you just have to say, you got the Met, you got the Whitney, you got um, the Jockey Club Gold Cup. Stephen you know, Foster, was, Stephen Foster was last yeah. week. Well, I was just talking about, yeah, the, the Naira races. Um, look, so it's going to be a dull, dead race with, with uh, you know, no no sizzle, a, a short field. Uh, you know, could we just say, look, you know, we don't need this anymore. Um, and I think you have to make some hard decisions like that. And, and you know, N- Naira's been innovative in the sense that on the same card, you have the Belmont Oaks that a couple years ago didn't even, wasn't even, you know, a, a real race, let alone it was just an idea. And they came up with a great idea to come up with the, with the Tierra Turf Triple. Um, and, and not only do you have horses from here, the states that are running, but the O'Briens, you know, uh, uh, are bringing horses in. Aiden's bringing a horse in. Joseph, his son, is bringing a horse in. And it's a 10-horse field and looks like it's going to be a great race. And now it's a grade one and legitimately so. So I, I think, like Bill, like you were saying, we can't just have these races in there um, on the card because tradition says we have to. Um, and, and it's, it's like who, you know, nobody cares about uh, other than – other than our sponsor, um, West Point Thoroughbred, that does have a horse in the race, nobody really cares about what's going on with the Suburban this year. Well, and it sucks because the Suburban is a very historic race. You know, the Hall of Fame is lined with winners of the Suburban, but it just it doesn't make sense on the calendar anymore. That's just a fact. The Stephen Foster was last week. The Met Mile was a couple weeks before that. People are already prepping for the Whitney at Saratoga. Like, you know, I'm just going to quote Terrence again one more time in the, in the story. It says, uh, you know, we're, it's a, okay. Bill's quoting the statistics of racehorses now running less than six per, times per year, half of what it was 20 years ago, is not caused by an excess of stakes races. The blame for that, if blame is the right word, is squarely on the shoulders of trainers with divisions of high class horses who feel that their win to, run, win to runner percentage is inviolable. We have quality racing year round in the U.S. We should incentivize trainers to run more frequently and penalize those whose runners fill a stall year round and only show up at the racetrack every other month at most. That sounds like a good idea, but it's very vague. How are you going to penalize them? How are you going to incentivize them? You know how you incentivize them? You get rid of a lot of the stakes races so they have fewer options. That is the most sensible, most you know, basic and direct way to incentivize guys to run their horses more often is to give them fewer options. Because as long as you give them this many options, they're going to pick the easiest spot. That's just how it is. And like John was saying, and we're going to talk about it in a little bit, uh, you know, the Belmont Oaks and Belmont Derby both have double digits in there. And that, you know, like you're saying, that became a grade one naturally, organically, because it, it, it attracted better and better fields every year. It's in a great spot on the calendar. Belmont kind of created this division in a way, the three-year-old turf and Philly division, um, you know, male and Philly division. That wasn't something that really existed that much that long ago, but Belmont created it with this festival. They were innovative. They did something to bring in new horse stock and to, you know, entice betters and good for them. And, you know, those races this weekend are really interesting to me as a horse player. And I'm going to dive in and try to find some value in there because it's worthwhile for me. So just saying like this horse, this race is historic. So it needs to continue to, to be kept running. That to me, like you said, is, is the old boys club speaking. That to me is the guy who's just, you know, obsessed with the prestige of the breeding and owning side of racing and does not care whether or not these fields are actually worthwhile anymore. And they're not. I'm sorry. The Suburban is not a worth worthwhile field anymore. The Mother Goose is not a worthwhile field anymore. It just doesn't make sense in terms of, uh, you know, merit, in terms of merit. 
does not make sense to have these races continue to be run on the calendar when they're just overlapping with each other. It's the easiest solution is to get rid of some of these redundant graded stakes races. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it's going to make breeding slightly, slightly less profitable for you because there are going to be fewer, you know, some fewer graded stakes races and, and stakes races to have black type on those pedigree pages. That's just the way of, of, of the of, of the direction of racing that racing is going. We just don't have as many horses. We just don't have as many horses running this frequently. It's just the way the momentum is going. And if you ignore it and if you try to stop it, you're only going to get five and six horse fields all across the country. And you know what? Um, in the Johnny and Edward, I wasn't the least bit concerned about my trifectas because there was no trifecta. Over the <laughs> race. Trifecta, yes. Exactly. I, I went. I went to go bet that race. I bet the one three ambulance. <laughs> that was good value. Come on, you got one sixty yeah. on Life Is Good Over Speakers Quarter. Come on, three yeah. to ten in a four horse field. <laughs> Who doesn't get excited about that? The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Lane's End. This week's Lane's End Stallion of the Week is Union Rags. We all remember him winning the Belmont. The son of Dixie Union has five grade one winners to his credit, including his leading, leading earner Express Trade, who won the grade one big cap at Santa Anita earlier this year. On Monday, Union Rags was represented at Belmont by Demands Respect, a three-year-old Chad Brown trainee who broke his maiden by eight lengths. Union Rags stags, stands at Lane's End for $30,000. Definitely go see him and the rest of that star-studded Lane's End roster all up and down. they got forces and stallions that will produce runners and produce winners for you. So definitely go check out Union Rags and Lane's End. We'll be right back after this message from Lane's End. Union Rags, proving Lane's End's tried and true stallion-making formula. A formula that leads to success for our partners and our stallions. He's a leader in his sire crop by graded stakes winners and grade one winners. He's a commercial standout with multiple million dollar sales and a six figure yearling average. And with four full books bred at 50 and 60,000, he has even more exciting progeny in the pipeline. Union Rags, a stallion that stands above the rest. With some of the fullest fields in the country, and quality racing year round. There's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Brats, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders. The KTA and the KTOB promote legislation with such industry partners as the American Horse Council and the NTRA. They play an active role in legislative matters on statewide and national levels. In conjunction with the Kentucky Thoroughbred Farm Managers Club, they increase the economic benefits to Kentucky breeders through the Breeders Incentive Program. Obviously, there were a lot of incentives as well for racing at Churchill Downs. Over this past meet, a ton of money being given away. We're looking forward to the rest of the year in Kentucky. Ellis Park meet has gotten better every year, I think in part because they've moved to a lot more turf racing, which is a little bit of the future. And then in the fall, we got the Churchill fall meet. And then we got Keeneland back to Churchill. So many opportunities for Kentucky breads to make a ton of money. So we're looking forward to the rest of the year in Kentucky. We were also looking forward to this interview for a little while. Eric Johnson, who is this in the new Stanley Cup champion of the Colorado Avalanche. He's been on the show before. He's a great guy. We were all super happy to see him win the Stanley Cup after a long time in the NHL. I believe he's been in the NHL for 14, 15 years. Big racing supporter, big owner, especially in California. He's now an owner and seller and breeder, too. He's only expanding his footprint in the game, and it's just great. It's you know, As a sports fan in general, it's great to see someone work that hard for that long and finally make it to the top of the mountain. So we talked to Eric about the cup win, about what he's going to do with the cup, about whether the cup is going to survive all of his Colorado Avalanche buddies. So check out our interview with Eric Johnson. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we're thrilled to welcome back to the show. Last time I introduced him as a former number one pick in the NHL, this time, I can introduce him as a Stanley Cup champion. Eric Johnson, welcome back to the show. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Really like you guys, uh, your show and what you guys do for the industry. It's a lot of fun to be on here. 
Well, we you. really appreciate you saying that. We were so happy for you to see you win the cup. So let's let's just give us an, our audience a, an idea of what the last nine or ten days have been like for you. Uh, well, I think I'm going to need a liver detox uh, very shortly. <laughs> um, uh, we've been consuming quite a few Bud Lights, uh, champagne, high noons, what have you. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, the the party is has been uh, about a week straight and now I'm finally getting a little R and R, but um, you know, as a kid, I, that's what I always dreamed to do is win the cup. And then you don't really know what's going to come after it. Right. But uh, the last, you know, seven days after we won has just been a hell of a ride. Well, and also you're, it's like you're on vacation now, right? That's not a fake zoom background. That's a real vacation background. <laughs> I'm uh yes, I'm down at uh, my house in, uh, Laguna Beach right now and uh, heading down to Del Mar here pretty quick in the next couple of weeks. So um, time for some R&R for sure. Nice. Uh, Eric, I, when I was first thinking about this, I thought, wow, winning the Stanley Cup, that might must be like winning the Kentucky Derby. The more I came to think about it is maybe it's more like winning the Breeders' Cup Classic because that's the championship event. It's at the end of the season. If you win that, you very well may be horse of the year, et cetera. Um, or maybe am I wrong? You know, What can you compare this to in horse racing? Hey, Bill. Yeah, I appreciate the question. I actually did think about that. Um, someone asked me that question and um, I gave it a little bit of thought. And what I came up with was it is like I've never won the Derby, um, but I I can imagine that it would feel a thousand times better than that, because when you're an owner in the Derby, you are a spectator and you have no impact on what happens when you are a part of a team that wins the Stanley cup, not only, um, is it, you know, you and your teammates, but you're actually out there doing it with them. And it's something that you have put your whole life into, um, since you were a kid. So, um, it's, it's very, I don't, you can't top this feeling. It's just amazing. Uh, I'm just super, I'm lucky because um, not a lot of people get to experience this. I played with a lot of great players that never won. And um, so, yeah, it, just to, to kind of answer your question, it would be like you win, you'd win the Breeders' Cup, the Derby, uh, the Travers, the Preakness, all in the same, you know, uh, summer or something like that. It would just be, um, it's very, very tough feeling to top. Yeah, and, and Eric, we were so excited when when uh, when the clock struck zero and, and we knew that you were going to be hoisting the Stanley Cup. When during the season did you think, hey, I, we have a good enough team, we're going to win the Stanley Cup? Was it in, in preseason? Was it when you beat the Rangers? Was it, um, you know, midway through the, the playoffs? Or was it like the last 30 seconds of, of game six? Hey, John, yeah. Um, so. Last year, we had a really, really good team, and we lost a bunch of guys at free agency. And um, our GM said in the media, I don't think we, we will ever be as deep as we are this past year. And then we started the season, we had about eight new players, lots of free agents. Um, and we started the season about 500. I think we were like five and five. And um, I think people were probably questioning um, what we had, but it took, it took a little bit of time for the chemistry to and the relationships to mash and the friendships to uh, create it. And um, we took off from there. And um, I kind of compare it to a horse. Um, you know, sometimes they don't take that step as a two-year-old to a three-year-old. And we had all these guys on our team take those big steps that you don't really know if they could take as players. So we had like Makar and Achushkin and all these guys um, take these big, big steps from the previous year that you can't, you don't, you think they can do it, but you're not really sure. So we had all these guys take these big steps and then we had contributions all throughout our lineup depth, all that um, really went into it. Um, and um, things just, the stars aligned. You had to stay healthy. We had a ton of injuries and COVID throughout the start of the year. And then we were mo mostly healthy throughout the playoffs. And, um, you know, I think when we got to about the, the Christmas point, January ish, um, and the all-star break, that's when we were like, holy crap, you know, we, uh, we have a chance to do this. And then our GM, you know, he's our GM stepped up at the deadline and brought in such key additions for us. Um, 
and uh, you know, the rest is history. Don't worry, you can say holy shit when you're talking about. <laughs> holy shit. Sorry, I didn't. We'll make it's just, just no f bombs, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, one of the things I noticed is I've seen you boys be very rough with the cup. I felt like it took y'all about twenty minutes or so to dent that thing. I saw it go tip over in the club the other day. What's your plan with the cup? What are you What are you going to do with it? Yeah, that poor thing that uh, it's taking a beating, Joe. That's for sure. But uh, yeah. thankfully, we've we've got it fixed, and uh, for now. Um, we've had our time with it and had a lot of fun. And we were, um, uh, you know, we had the parade, and then we we took the cup out with uh, to uh, Whiskey Row uh, Country Bar in Denver, and, and it's actually and Dirk Bentley showed up and played on stage with us and with the cup, and so that was pretty sweet. And uh, so my cup day. Um, and I texted John about this. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, Labor Day weekend and, uh, Labor Day Saturday, Pacific Classic Day. I'm going to start in Denver and I think I'm going to bring it to Del Mar. Um, so that's the plan to bring it to Del Mar. And, uh, you know, the cup is such an amazing thing because whether you know anything about hockey or not, everyone, everyone knows the Stanley cup is, um, Except I actually did get congratulated on winning the Heisman Trophy the other day for somebody. <laughs> and, I, and I said, uh, what? And they're like, oh, you won the championship. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we won the Stanley Cup. And the lady was so embarrassed. But anyway, um, yeah, so the plan is right now I'm going to do a, a visit right now in Denver uh, in the morning when I have it, do a children's hospital visit, let some Colorado Avalanche fans see the cup, and then uh, get out to Denver and have a huge party. It should be a, quite the banger. Mm. Yeah. Hey, Eric, you're 34 years old now, so you probably have three, four, five more really good years in the NHL. Yeah. Have you thought about your, okay, maybe not, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe less, we'll see. But I mean, at your age, you're obviously still at the top of your game. Will you become more involved in racing after your playing career is over? And if so, how, how, how might that be? Yeah, another good question. Um, I was thinking about that the other day. Some people were texting me like, oh, why didn't, two year olds this year, you only bought a couple mm-hmm. two year olds. And I was just like, I'm so focused on what I had to do mm-hmm. um with um with uh with the cup and our in our playoff run that uh you know I don't I don't I didn't have the time to to focus on any of that. But um to answer your question more, Bill, I think uh I really haven't thought about it. I think um I've always wanted to have a farm, a small little farm and I love Lexington. So I could see something where, you know, I have you know, eight to 10 mares. And, um, I have uh, maybe a, a little breeding operation out in, uh, out in Lexington. I just love it out there. Um, but I haven't really thought about that. I'm, I'm a real in the moment guy. Um, and, uh, I really haven't thought that far ahead to be honest with you, but racing is, uh, obviously a sport I really care about. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, that's going to be, uh, at the forefront when I, when I bring the cup to, uh, to Del Mar. Mm-hmm. And Eric, you know, this 2022 has been a phenomenal year. Not only did you win the Stanley Cup, um, but also you had the sales topper. You sold the sales topper at the basic tip in February sale. Tell us what it was like when Brilliant Cup was going into the ring. And, and you know, did you expect to get three quarters of a million dollars for it? What was that? What was that ride like? Yeah, it's been good. I mean, we had McKinnon run third in the Breeders' Cup. And then we had uh, Brilliant Cup, the $50,000 claim. Um, that we were lucky enough, Doug's team got her to get graded stakes placed, and then we uh, we cashed in and, and sold it for seven fifty, like you mentioned. But uh, um, so we had a couple offers after she ran second uh, in the La Brea at uh, Santa Anita, and I think we had like five hundred thousand dollar offers or something like that. We just decided to roll the dice, and uh, you guys all know how how tough it is to to turn a profit in this game. So when you can take the chance to cash in and, um, you know, turn 50 into 750. That, uh, that doesn't happen too often. So basically tip did a great job and, um, high gate sales, Jacob West and Joe Gordon, who can sign did a great job for us. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's special. Um, you never know. You don't expect that to happen when you claim a horse 50,000, you maybe hope that it can, you know, win a starter or something and, uh, you can move it along and, and, uh, break even, but, um, yeah, luckily she, you know, hit the board in a couple stakes and then life is good popped up in her pedigree and second dam. And, uh, that helped for sure. I just want to ask a quick follow-up on something Bill asked. And then I guess I'll ask you a racing question. I'm the only <laughs> hockey guy on the panel. Please so do. <laughs> I don't mind just talking hockey for 20 minutes. It's just a quick follow-up on what Bill asked. You know, he asked if you had a couple, three, four or five good years left. Is there any thought at all of going out on top since you've been around for a while? 
No, I'm going to, I'm going to come back and play Joe. Uh, I have one year left on my deal. Um, I don't know a lot of people in their right mind that would walk away from uh, a couple million bucks to play hockey. You know what yeah. I mean? So I'm, gonna, I'm healthy, thankfully, um, stayed healthy this year and I feel good. And, uh, I had so much fun this year. I, uh, you know, even, even, you know, we'd land at two in the morning in Edmonton in the middle of November, December, you know, it would be zero degrees and you're on the bus. And I was just, I remember just thinking like, this is, this is so much fun. Like, I don't, I don't, it's stuff like that's the stuff you miss the flights, having beers on the plane after the, after the games, playing cards, uh, going to all the dinners with the guys. Um, so, you know, thankfully my body held up this year and I'd love to keep playing a little bit more. Um, so we'll see, just take it year by year, uh, from here. And, and, um, yeah, a lot of people have asked me, uh, are you going to retire? Are you going to retire? And uh, no, I'm not going to retire. Oh, listen, I'm not pushing you out the door. You still clearly. No, no, you're that. fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, yeah. I appreciate yeah, the no, question. No, but it was great to see, like, you, you still acted like a kid out there when you won the cup. So I was clearly young at heart still as well. Just a quick racing question. Um, you know, the big story, I think, in California, or mainly a California racing guy, at least for now, the big story the last two years or so, I think has been the improved safety record, especially at Santa Anita from the, from the catastrophe that we saw in 2019. We had you on the show last time because you were going to, going to save basically an $8,000 claimer named Princess Dorian. So you're clearly a guy who, who cares a lot about horse safety. What's your reaction to how Santa Anita and California racing have just turned this around completely safety wise? I think they've done a great job. I think, um, you know, no matter what, you're not going to escape the negativity. I think that's always going to be there. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's always going to be someone that's upset, but I think just to see this, the statistics that have come out recently, um, I think there probably was a little need for some reform. And, uh, I think the, the leadership has done a really good job throughout the state. Um, you know, I think what really helped is those pre-race checks, um, you know, every horse gets checked out and I'm sure it makes some owners upset because some of their horses won't run. And, you know, you, you spend 30, 60 days on bills and you get your horse ready to run and then they pull it out. But for the, for the betterment of the game and the longevity of the game, I think those are things that probably needed to happen and steps needed to be taken. So, um, overall, I think they should be commended. They did just awesome. And the game is in a much better place, uh, uh, than it was in a, in a couple of years ago and Hissa and all these, uh, groups that, uh, you know, have stepped up and, um, a lot of people, uh, stepped up for the game and I think it was needed and it's helped throughout the, the, you know, the country for sure. Eric, one last question for me. You mentioned McKinnon. Um, he was one of the better horses that you had at one point in time, a possible derby horse. Haven't seen him since February. Where is he and, and what's next for him? Yeah, so he's uh, going to make uh, his comeback in the Oceanside uh, opening day at Del Mar. He's, I think he's had uh, six or seven works. He's really, really doing well. We gave him um, about 60 days off after the, I think it was the Sham and the El Camino. And um, he ran good in those races. We just decided that, you know, he wasn't going to be a derby horse. We think he's best on grass. So I think we'll t- we're going to run in the Oceanside and then we'll go. Um, I think there's a Saratoga Derby at the end of the meet mm. or something like that. And then there's a, there's a big race at Kentucky Downs that we'll look to um, after that. So he's doing really, really good. And then um, we have uh, Makar in the pipeline who runs uh, Friday at Belmont for Brad Cox, named after Kale Makar, our stud defenseman. So he runs, I think, in the first race. Um, so they keep the hockey names going. And, and that was going to be my last question is I, I know that, uh, that, that we've spoken about this, the young sire Nyquist and what a great young sire he is. And, and, and I know you really like naming horses after, after your hockey brethren. Is there another name that you're, you know, hoping to save for your next good cult? Yeah, I have Makar, um, that's named after Kale, of course, Kale Makar, stud defenseman. So he's, he's running with Brad Cox, his first race. Um, so that'll be exciting to have McCarr run and uh, obviously with McKinnon and I had Landis Gog, who was a good smart for us. And, um, yeah, it's fun. The, the boys like, uh, the hockey names and, um, some of the fans like to interact with it too. So we'll see what McCarr can do on turf on Friday. Yep. You may, you may want to, just as a helpful hint, you may want to name one Sackett since, you know, he's your GM and, and, uh, he may be signing your next contract. Just, just a helpful hint. I, I thought about that. It's available too, so I might have to reserve it. <laughs> John's always got the angle. Always got the angle. Yeah. Listen, I mean, he's a green group client. I got to try to make and save him as much money as possible. That's <laughs> right, and you and you have. 
<laughs> All right. Well, Eric, thank you so much for the time. We were so, so happy to see you win the cup, not just because you're a big racing supporter, because you're a good guy as well. And you definitely put in the work. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you, thank, Eric. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Hey, appreciate great it. Great job. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Eric Johnson, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week features There Goes Harvard, who worked four furlongs at Santa Anita on Saturday in 47-3. and three. It was the third fastest of 86 works at the distance. You can see that work on the screen right now if you're watching the video portion of this show. The Michael McCarthy trainee won the Grade 1 Hollywood Gold Cup in his last start. was the first Grade 1 winner for Will Take Charge, obviously probably pointing towards the Pacific Classic. And like I say every week, but now it really, really matters. We're only a week away from Saratoga, eight days. There's a lot of action going on on the Oklahoma track, especially the turf course, especially and also on the main track as well. So the place to be and the place to check out all the, the firsters, all the horses that, you know, you look in the PPs and you say, well, that looks like a fast work, but I haven't seen it. If you want to see it, go to XBTV.com, search the horse. They're most likely going to have it. They got a lot of they got a lot of great camera people and a lot of great organization at these tracks that can show you all the stuff that would normally be blind to you in the PPs. And I know that's going to be important to all the all the little people, all the handicappers coming up at this Saratoga meet. So we're looking forward to that. Go to xbtv.com for all of your workout needs. All right, so we kind of led into this from the last segment. John brought up the the Belmont Turf Festival, which is this Saturday. Great. Great races, five euros, five euro shippers in each race in the Belmont Oaks and the Belmont Derby. We have 13 horses in the Belmont Derby, 10 horses in the Belmont Oaks, also the Suburban and the Victory Rider on that card. Um, at Delaware, we have a couple of stakes races. We got the Delaware Handicap, which is a great two. You know, that used to be a big deal, honestly. That used to be a race that a lot of top fillies and mares pointed to. I honestly have not heard of any of the horses in this year's Dell Cap, unfortunately, but the, the Robert Dick Memorial Stakes is a great three over there. Again, turf gets a big field. You know, that's the future. Like the, these big turf races, those are the most bettable races more and more these days. We also have cards, uh, big cards at Indiana and Iowa. I'm sorry, guys. Like I, I, I support the smaller tracks having these big days. Why are these races on the same day? Why is the Indiana Derby and the Indiana Oaks on the same day as the Iowa Oaks and the Iowa Derby? Like it just, it makes absolutely no sense to me, but you know, we, we are happy for those cards to get their moment in the sun, you know, Saturday night um, and, and get those, those big races at their track. Cause I, I think, you know, especially Indiana, I think does a really good job for the horse players. Um, so, so we're looking forward to that. Also the corn Husker this weekend at Prairie Meadows, they should just rename that race. The next go stakes after what he did last year in that field, it's never going to be topped. Although I guess there is a Knicks go stakes. We already made a Knicks go stakes <laughs> at Churchill Downs because <laughs> we, we, God knows we need more stakes races. Um, can, we make it the, can we make it the Terrence Collier Invitational? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, it's, it's, it really is the, the Belmont turf races. I think that's the most exciting thing over this weekend. Um, you yeah, know, we actually had an Annapolis who came back and won the Manila over the weekend. We didn't talk about him in the weekend review, but he's a really nice horse, really nice turf horse for Todd Pletcher. He was thinking about going in the Belmont Derby this weekend, but I think he's going to wait um, to put him in the, the Saratoga Derby instead. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, not no household names yet, but it's hard, you know, this early in the year with the three-year-old turf horses to have household names. Point is, big fields, shippers, big-time trainers, and actually a, a bettable product on Saturday. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, these Belmont turf races are very interesting. And I think a couple storylines here. First of all, um, you know, I look at the Charlie Appleby horses and, you know, they don't get me that excited when I just look at them on paper. But, you know, is this going to be an encore of what he did last year? That just unbelievable year he had where he uh, ran 18 horses, won nine. I believe I should have looked this up. I believe all nine were graded grade one stakes races. Maybe, um, Joe, you even mentioned at one point that maybe he would deserve a little, a few votes for, for trainer of the year in the Eclipse Awards after what he did last year. Um, and the Euros bring their jockeys with them. You got um, uh, you got Ryan Moore coming in. You got Frankie Dettori coming in. Um, Pasquier, what's his first name, the French jockey? Anybody know? He's coming in. Don't know. Yeah, that guy from France is coming in as well. Um, the Belmont Derby, uh, it's very interesting what you know Kenny McPeak is up to here. Uh, two horses, first of all, Classic Causeway comes back in two weeks after the Ohio Derby, which you never see um, uh, anyone do outside of a guy like McPeak. Um, he showed a little bit of promise in the Ohio Derby after running so poorly in the Kentucky Derby and the Florida Derby. McPeak is hoping that the move to grass, you know, vaults him up to the next level. You know, one point in time, he looked like a really interesting horse with a bright future. And then Tis the Bomb is back. Um, he goes back. You know, we think of him as a turf horse. But the thing is, he hasn't run on the grass since last year when he was second in the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile Turf. Uh, McPeak, uh, he had some success on synthetic. He tried the Derby. It didn't work out. You know, how will he fare? Um, I would think he, I don't know if he'd be the favorite or not. Maybe they'll go for one of the Euros. But I would think he'd be the horse to beat in there. And then, of course, um, you know, the big story in the Suburban is, will Uriah St. Louis once again pick up that fifth place jack? We got to have Uriah on the show. I feel like we bring him oh, on yeah, more yeah. every single week. So we got to get him on. Ahead, yeah, he's, he's he's quickly becoming a fan favorite. He he actually, in my mind, is replacing Kameen as the go-to <laughs> you know, comparison to talk about. Um, I want to bring up, you know, Joe, you mentioned some of these smaller racetracks, and, and they really should be highlighted. You know, Delaware has a really nice weekend card. You mentioned um, Indiana Downs, uh, or she, now it's called Horseshoe Indianapolis. Um, Prairie Meadows, you know, they, they all have, you know, really big cards coming on. But we're going to be talking, since we're talking about the theme of the day is graded races. I'm going to already put in an advance request that the American Academy of, of State Races, or whatever they're called, <laughs> looks at the Schaefer Memorial this year, the Schaefer Memorial at Horseshoe Indianapolis, where we're running helium. It's an eight-horse field. Do you know that five of the horses in the race either won or placed a graded stake race, including Mr. Wireless, who won not one but two grade threes, Running Ray, who ran third in a grade three, um, South Bend, who finished second in a grade three, then, of course, you have the famous Thomas Shelby, who ran second by a neck in a grade three, and Helium, our horse Helium, who won the Tampa Bay Derby as, as a grade two. I need, I think we need to have this race be graded next year um, to, again, continue to pump up some of these smaller racetracks. So just if, if you're listening to the show, and I know you are, um, and you're on the, you're on the, uh, you're on the panel to, to go over graded stake races, give this one a look, will you? You hear that? You hear that? We want fewer stakes races and great stakes races unless Don Green has a horse. Unless I have a horse. He's right. gelding, so what good will it do him if he, if he wins this race from a sire standpoint? It, 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 it's true. Yeah, from a sire standpoint. You're exactly correct, Bill Finley. Um, but, but, you know, people in the know, like Terrence Collier, know that we actually have two fillies from that family. So, you know, obviously, if, if you know, if, if, uh, if we get graded place again, um, you know, then it only it only begets good for me. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all that matters. <laughs> exactly. So the quiet part loud, finally. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just to, to you know, go back to what I was saying, the reason that the Iowa Derby and the Indiana Derby are on, on the same day is because where else are they going to run? You know, what other what other three year old race could they possibly compete with in this chock full of, of three year old race calendar? It just it's not it's not realistic for them to run anywhere else. But, yeah, I just feel bad that those races are cannibalized, especially because, you know, like I said, those small tracks definitely deserve their day in the sun. And just to mention the Belmont stuff one more time, we had so we have 10 total euros. What I love seven different trainers. So it's not just Aiden O'Brien and Charlie Appleby sending you know the cavalry in for these races, seven different European trainers found these races interesting and, and potentially lucrative enough to send their horses across the pond to there. So that's, you know, like I said, that's that's a, a series that's growing organically because it provides both the betters and the owners 
what they want. It's not impossible, guys. We can all be on the same team. Yeah, and and kudos, one last thing, kudos with all sincerity to Andrew Burns, who's the stakes coordinator for Naira, and he's been there forever, and he's a really good guy. But, man, he hustles. He is there at, literally at Saratoga. He's there every day on the phone calling up, trying to convince people to bring their horses to, to Saratoga, which you would think be, would be an easy job because it's Saratoga. Um, but it's not, as you can see by, by some of these fields. And, and, you know, Naira really has embraced this idea of having young turf horses come here and compete for a lot of money. And they do a great job in, in timing the races and, and the distances and, and getting horses to come over here because it's just a natural progression. They come here for those races, the, you know, the three race series, Belmont, Saratoga, Belmont. They stay maybe for Kentucky Downs. Keeneland, and then they go right to the Breeders' Cup. I mean, it's a natural progression for these horses to come over from Europe to, to run in these races. So, again, tip of the hat to, to Andrew Burns um, for all that he does with the stakes coordination at, uh, at Naira. Yeah, well, and I just, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, when we when we bitch about the, the short fields and the stakes and gray stakes races, I'm not, you know, I, it's not because of the that, you know, stakes coordinators or racing office people aren't working hard. Like, I think they're doing everything they possibly can. So if we have any racing officials that, you know, get, you know, watch our show and, and, you know, get a little defensive about us constantly complaining about these stakes races. I don't think it's your guys' fault at all. I think it's, it's basically everybody but y'all. Y'all are doing your jobs. It's just the owners and the people who, who organize the calendar have put you basically in an impossible position. And, and I know you guys are doing your best. So, yeah, we're looking forward to that, to, to that card a ton on Saturday, a couple of big grade one races. And like I said, organically, organically, this series grew. It's not on the card because – a great horse won it 40, 50 years ago, and we need to keep it for, you know, the the history's sake. I think just we need more races like this and like Kentucky Downs that naturally attract betting handle and attract attract top class horses. So, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye on those Belmont Stakes races this weekend and good luck to everybody at Indiana and, and Prairie Meadows and, and putting on those cards also. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtb.com. Looking forward to the grade two suburban this weekend for West Point, <laughs> for West Point's purposes. West Point's first captain is in a field of five. Shug McGahey trainee won the grade three Pimlico special on Preakness weekend in his last start. I thought that was a really good effort. You know, the Tide Putcher horse kind of got the jump on him. Looked like he was spinning his wheels a little bit on the turn and really came alive in the stretch. I think he's definitely one of those horses. There aren't that many anymore that really relish a mile and a quarter. I think a mile and an eighth even is probably a little bit too short for him. So he gets the mile and a quarter Saturday in the suburban. So best of luck to West Point all the partners and also this weekend West Point has great three winner cavalry charge running in the Jonathan Schuster stakes at Horseshoe Indianapolis I always want to say Indiana Horseshoe Indianapolis on Saturday so best of luck to everybody at West Point we can't we can't wait to see y'all at Saratoga and at Del Mar this summer especially with all those babies and of course the big horse flight line we'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds all the thrills fraction of the bills experience the power of the partnership change your life make new friends and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing west point thoroughbreds the gold standard in racing partnerships visit westpointtb.com being a small family business i guess we're part of a dying breed we're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. On Saturday, Roll Again Dancer broke his maiden at Monmouth Park. He's a graduate of Legacy's 2021 Keeneland September consignment as a son of Gervin, who was also a, Le a Legacy graduate back in 2015. So nice full circle win there for, for the Legacy grad. And at next week's facing July sale, watch out for HIP 276 from the Legacy Bloodstock consignment. The yearling is a son of Practical Joke and is from the family of multiple stakes winner OK to Dance and multiple grade one winner 
Devil is due, obviously an influential name there as well. So you're going sales season, finally getting ramped up. Best of luck to Tommy and Wendy and all the team at Legacy this summer and fall. This week's Remy cartoon is a guy who's on a little bit of a life raft, makeshift life raft. You'd assume in the ocean, not the Saratoga lakes. He says, yes, yes, thank you for saving me. But more importantly, when's opening day at Saratoga as someone is lowering a life preserver to him? That's kind of, I feel like, how we feel in the winter. You know, an aqueduct is just this this desperate wasteland waiting for someone to come along and, you know, throw down the lifeline of Saratoga for us as horse players and as racing fans. So, like I said, we're only eight days away now. Can't wait for that. I'm sure Remy's got a couple other good ones up his sleeve for Saratoga and all the big winners we're going to see this summer. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. Don't forget, the Keeneland September Yearling Sale begins Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Eric Johnson, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week. Mm-hmm.